uh, what's in front of us here. They, they've been uh, like I kind of thought was going to happen. Uh, uh, they took the, that four-day window, all those young kids, and took a deep breath. And, um, and they've been unbelievably good in practice the last couple of days. So uh, now we got to go out there and keep building and keep playing and keep getting better. Frank Howard, Mike, and Justin, and TJ. Uh, Mike's practicing. He's he's good. It's funny. It's it, it's just one of them years. It just I, I've never my first year as a, uh, as the head coach at my alma mater, uh, Miami Senior High School in 1995 96 school year. We lost four starters during the course of the year to injuries. Three of them for the year. Uh, one of them came back. Uh, and we we ended up winning the state championship, but it was hard. Uh, but outside of that, I, as a head coach or an assistant, I've never been uh, uh, a part of you know just what we've been through this year. And you know, Don's been through it. Will obviously has been. It's just incredible. I I, I don't know what's uh, you know uh, going on on this campus this year, but it's it's uh, just one of them years. And you know, Mike gets back from Christmas. And he's fine. He wakes up uh, the morning of the 28th. He's got a shut eye, got pink eye. So now he don't practice on the 28th. And you know, but he he practiced yesterday, and uh, it took him about 30 seconds of practice to miss a layup. So we welcomed him back right away. Uh, you know, Justin's doing some shooting on the side. He's still not close. Um, and what I mean by close is he's not in the next five, six days. It's still a little longer than that. Uh, and who's the other one, you asked me? TJ. Yeah, TJ, uh, they they took the cast off. Uh, they reevaluated. Uh, uh, he's got a, a pretty severe high ankle sprain. Uh, we're going to, uh, you know, that's, that's a significant time loss, six to eight weeks, somewhere in there from the time of the injury. Uh, so red shirting is on the table right now. We're in those talks. So Mike will go tomorrow then. Yeah, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. Mike, Mike's good to go. But it's just, it, it's just, it's comical, you know. It's, it's <laughs> you, you, you sit at home and you, you plan practice, and you want to teach A, B, and C, and, and structure your practice a certain way, and then you show up and, and boom, another guy, you know, can't practice, and it's, uh, 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 kind of throws you for a loop a little bit. What is the we talked about TJ's red shirt on the table. Is there an X amount of game? Like, is he to a thresh? Do you have to appeal that? What all goes into that once he's already played? Yeah, he hasn't. He, he still has not played too many games. I, I don't know if I'm wording that the right way. And then I believe the cutoff date is January 16. I, I, I'll confirm that next time I speak to you guys, maybe after the game uh, tomorrow. I think January 16 is the date that I was told that it, if you play after that date, red shirts off the table. Uh, and uh, but I think that's the cutoff date. Uh, but it's it's on the table right now. We we started those talks. Uh, he got back late night the 27th. He went to see our doctor the 28th. Um, all the, the 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 opinions were shared with. Uh, um, with his family, with him, you know, obviously our doctors, uh, the trainer, uh, you know, and then we spoke about it briefly yesterday and, and we're going to keep talking here and, um, uh, you know, I, I'm a dad and a basketball coach and yeah, I want to win games and I want our best players on the court as many games as possible. Uh, but at the same time, um, you know, six weeks from now, that's got us sometime in February. Is it the right thing to do for a kid to, to, to burn a year to have him play, you know, another six games or something like that? It's, we're trying to figure that out. Just talking to Chris about Alonzo. He said he compared what Alonzo's going through right now to what Chris went through his freshman year, where you mm -hmm. kind of throw him on the court and you just said, go get the ball kind of thing. But he says that he's he's seeing those spurts where Alonzo could be the the player that he thinks he can be. Is that can you just add on to what you're seeing from him right now? Yeah, two things for Alonzo. Uh, uh, 
uh, he's got basketball instincts. Chris didn't have basketball instincts. Chris, basketball was still kind of – still is. When you see him play sometimes, uh, it's new to him. Alonzo has instincts, so he understands – uh, passing and, and angles and things that Chris has worked real hard to, to comprehend. But to Chris's point, yes. You know, Alonzo, uh, two things with Alonzo. Number one, you miss seven weeks of practice in the month of October and early November um, uh, as a freshman. It really, really hinders your learning curve. Uh, we, 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 we're trying to figure out how to help him grow individually. But it's like I compare it to a math class. You know, you, you get a student that transfers in the eighth week of class, that student hasn't been learning at the rate that the people in your classroom has been learning. You can't hold the other 30 students back so you can catch up one student. You gotta manage that dynamic to get that one student as close to as close as possible to where the other 30 people are without preventing the other 30 from growing. Um, so we're, we're trying to deal with that with Alonzo. Uh, Alonzo's biggest challenge right now is getting his body in Division I shape, which then will allow him to get his mind out of, I'm a heavy, slow-footed kid. Uh, he's lost a lot of weight over the last two years of his life. Uh, he's been changing his body since he got here. Um, you know, his body has to adapt to, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking at, the physicality, the speed of college basketball. And he's having to do that after missing seven weeks of practice. So uh, it's going to take time with him. But, yes, you know, he screws up all – like he took two charges against, who was it, Clemson? I applaud him. I've been begging Felipe and Mike Coltra to take charges. He went in there and took him. But you know why he took him? Because he was playing a one-man zone. So that means that his ball screen defense was not good because he was in the wrong place. But I applaud him for once he realized, oh, boy, I'm in the wrong place, he stood there and took him, which were huge plays for us. It gave us a chance in that second half to come back. Frank, nothing against North Greenville or anything, but the end of the week SEC play does start. Have you tried to talk to the kids about the grind of an 18-game league schedule and playing two games a week? And do you think they, they get a grasp of that before they actually play in it? Yeah, that's, that's why we scheduled and played the way we did. And, you know, and it's, uh, that's what we try to do with our non-conference schedule, um, um, you know, and uh, to get us ready for the mindset. Have I spoken to them about it? Not really. You know, because I approach every game the same way, and it's creating a mindset that you don't just get up for certain games and then the next game just say, ah, whatever. Uh, you know, we're approaching North Greenville as if we're playing Florida. It's uh, – uh, I, I don't know how to do it any other way, Dave. And I'm not saying – like yesterday, I'm watching Nick Saban and Alabama play, and I don't know how old Coach Saban is right now. He's got more championships than the rest of the country combined. Yet he gets just as mad in that game as he does when they're playing the Citadel, you know. And that's that's I've been trained not because he does it. I do it. No, it's the way I was raised and trained, um, and it's what I believe in. And I'm 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 not saying I'm Nick Saban, but I watch him and I enjoy the fact that he wants his team to play the right way every day. And that's what I push for, to get my team to play that way. We're, you know, even though we've gotten so much better in the last five weeks, regardless of all the adversity, whether it's the injuries, the freshmen, or losing of games, we're so much better now than we were five weeks ago. It's not even close. Obviously, I can't make the person that hasn't seen us play understand that because they look at the record. Oh, they stink. Okay, our record's not very pretty, okay? But I don't sit around worried about our record. I'm sitting around trying to figure out a way to keep getting us better. And we're a lot better now than we were five weeks ago. Um, and, and we got to keep pushing for that. But truth be told, we've lost four in a row. We, we can't show up to North Greenville and say, oh, let's get ready for Florida. No, we, we got to go play the best game we can play uh, and, and figure out a way to win. 
uh, because that's this team needs a win. This team needs some good things to happen to it and then be rewarded with a win at the end of the game. Coach, dovetailing off of that, you said this team has gotten better over the last five weeks. In what ways specifically have you seen you know, the growth, especially with the young players? All the above. I mean, heck, we couldn't guard Augusta State when they came in here in, in November. We couldn't guard them. And, and, you know, obviously I didn't X and O it, and I didn't try to scheme or any of that stuff. We didn't do any game prep or scouting reports. But the game was played. We couldn't guard them. And you know, now we're out there. We're guarding Virginia and all these other teams pretty darn good. Uh, you know, and, and uh, let's not lose sight of some stuff, OK? We, we've lost games. I get it. Uh, go look at Stony Brook, what they've done. Because you know, we want to sit around and say, well, we lost to Stony Brook. Go see who they've beaten. Go see what their record is. Pretty good. Uh, Michigan, Virginia, two of the top three teams in the country. Clemson, Sweet 16 team, and we didn't play them without their best player. We played them with their best player, the way it should be. Went nose to nose with them. Did we get it done? No. We couldn't have done that five weeks ago. You know, we couldn't have guarded them. We couldn't have, heck, forget score. Uh, and, you know, and, and we're doing that with three, four freshmen right in the middle of the whole thing. We're doing that with Evan Hinson, like not even practicing, just standing on the side and, and then throwing them out there for, you know, X number of minutes per game. Um, yeah, and that's, uh, that's what I care about, growth. We, we're, we're in practice. Forget games. You guys get to see games. We're so much – we understand how to practice now. We had no idea how to practice in November, none. The fight was to get these kids to understand how to practice. And then you lose, you know, Manaya and whatever from your team, and now your numbers in practice go down. So now you've got eight, nine guys in practice. We had to go find quad on walking campus so we can have a 10th person in practice. He's got no idea what he's doing. And we're asking him to help us get better in practice. So you can't win in games until you understand how to prepare. And, and we're, now we're getting how to prepare. We're getting that. We're getting a lot better there. So now it translates to being able to play better in games, which we have. Fans, people that don't watch, they don't care about progress. They care about wins. I've said this 100 times. I get it. I signed up for the job. But within the job, I don't want to disrespect anybody. I've never cared about what others think. I care about my team in the locker room. And my team in the locker room has to get better. We're getting better. And that's what I'm concerned with. I have a two-part question. First one, you, uh, I think when, when Chris got all, preseason All-SEC, you told him, you announced, you told him that uh, congratulations, you were voted the ugliest guy in the SEC. What, what are we looking at? I think I've met this guy before that just walked by. Is that Ken Stoudemire? I thought he retired. What's he doing in here? <laughs> yes. But I think, <laughs> I think you called Chris the ugliest guy in the SEC. Uh, what were your thoughts on the haircut that he got? Did now, that improve his? He looks like a human being again. Okay. <laughs> Looks like like a normal human being again. I, the stuff he was trying to grow on his head, I, I got no idea what that was. Uh, uh, no, nah, it, it, listen, I listen. I work for somebody who I went and recruited. I thought I recognized you. I thought you retired. I still got a leak in my locker room over here. I've been waiting for three years for it to be fixed. <laughs> but I, I work for a guy who's a dear friend of mine. But he believed everyone should cut their hair the same way. And when I went to recruit, I had to engage those conversations with recruits. And some of those kids came, and they agreed to cut their hair and keep it a certain way. I understood that. Heck, I was just reading something about John Wooden today, about Bill Walton. Bill Walton didn't want to shave and cut his hair. And John Wooden said, you're more than welcome to keep your hair however you is. I can't tell you how to, how to look but I can determine who plays, so it's been nice knowing you. 
next day the guy shaved and cut his hair. So it, it's it, – I, I don't believe – in telling people how they should groom their hair or how they should keep their beard, all I tell them is it needs to be neat. And like me and Hassani are having those conversations right now because his hair is not neat right now. I don't care how he wants to wear it like that. That's, that's him. He's representing his na the name on this side of his jersey to a greater degree than the one in the front. But at the end of the day, he's also representing South Carolina and me and everyone else that's on the team. So I, I get in those conversations with them in private so they understand how it, it might impact them in life, whether it's fair or not. It's just I got to have that conversation with them. They're the ones that get to choose how if, if they want to be judged by appearance. Does that make sense what I'm saying? They, they, but it's my duty to make them understand that. Uh, but no, Chris, Chris, he chose to do that. No one forced him into doing that. And he actually looks like a young kid again. He, <laughs> he looks a lot better. But with, with Chris, though, you mentioned a couple weeks ago about one of your issues offensively has been spacing and, and in the half court and mm -hmm. get, getting a feel for one another. Mm -hmm. Chris and AJ, how have, how have you been able to mesh their two skill sets together? Has there been challenging times because mm -hmm. AJ is everything downhill and Chris likes to – eat up that space near the rim? Like, how, how have you kind of managed those two? Yeah, it's the biggest misconception that exists. Think about this, okay? Let, let's Because everyone talks now about spacing, and you got to have all these guys out, and people that post up take up the paint, and now you can't drive. Uh, you remember guys like Isaiah Thomas and Tiny Archibald and all those guys? They played in an era where the NBA played two seven-footers, they both played in the low post, and they were elite shot blockers. Yet those guys drove the ball every single time and scored. It, it, it's, we're all victims of what we allow ourselves to believe. It, it, all that spacing stuff is a facade. So everyone plays with – can you imagine if Michael Jordan played, no disrespect because he's one of my favorite players, with Draymond Green as a center on the other team? Can you imagine if Carl Malone played with Draymond Green as a starting center on the other team? You understand what I'm saying? Those guys scored at the rim with every team having two low post guys, so the paint was congested. It's not AJ getting downhill and Chris posting up. That becomes that creates assets because defense doesn't have to help outside the three point line. You know where defense is taught to help? when you get close to the paint. So if Chris, AJ understanding the value of post-ups, he's learned now that as the ball goes inside and back out, now you get to make a decision because what happens? His man's off the body. So as the ball gets to him, he's got to make decisions, shoot, drive. And he's starting to comprehend that. Uh, AJ's trying to learn how to score against college defenses. Uh, he's. I don't know if he still is. I really don't. Never do look at stats, uh, individual stats like that. I, I don't know if he's still our leading scorer or not. But you know what Brad Brunell, you know what John Beeline, you know what uh, Tony Bennett, you know what they probably did? They presented a scouting report to their team and said, A.J. Lawson, this is what he does. He's your leading scorer. He can't do A, B, and C. And he went out against – uh, guys that started in the national championship last year. He went out against Virginia, who's the number one overall seed last year, who returns their, their whole perimeter. He went out and went against Clemson, fifth-year senior, fifth-year senior, fifth-year senior, fifth-year senior, four of their starting five guys. And he had to deal with older guys, understanding how to take him out of his strength. That's part of the deal. That's, that's, and, and then me, I have to continue to understand him as a player, what he's good at, what he's not good at. We're trying to put some things in there to get him to comprehend that I'm starting to feel our strengths for him, and he needs to comprehend how to play within that structure. It's, so it's, it's a growth. It takes time. You know, there was stuff I did with Sindarius as a senior that I never would have thought of doing with him as a freshman, because I just continued to understand them as a player.